to continue the Gospel of John, and we left off where Jesus was saying that the glory has been given unto him, and he's asked the Father to pray for disciples. Now, the next phase we want to look at is Jesus praying for you and me, for those who will follow after his resurrection. Now, before we get there, there's a little verse that I would really do want to get to, and it's a verse that sometimes we overlook, sometimes it's not explained, and I just want to get into it. It's verse chapter, uh, verse 12 of chapter 17. And Jesus says, while I was with them in the world, this is the disciples, I kept them in your name, the power of your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. Brilliant so far. Except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So we hear now, in the middle of all of this beautiful glory, glorify me, Lord, as I glorify you, and they, they have glorified me. Now we have a bit of a darkness coming in because he has lost one, and it's the son of perdition. So we as Christians, we want to know, well, what is the son of perdition? Why did Jesus lose him? And if he lost him, can he lose us as well? The Bible says, so that scripture might be fulfilled, and this was actually in Psalm 41, verse 9, when the psalmist, which was King David, said, Even my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lip, lifted up his heel against me, turned away from me, betrayed me. Wow. Now, we, we think about um, uh, Judas. and we, we remember, if we go back to, to John chapter 13, this is where the washing of the feet Jesus went and he washed the disciples' feet, including Judas's. And when he came to Peter, Peter didn't want them. Then Peter, Jesus said, you can have no part of me unless I, I, I wash you. And he said, oh, just don't wash my feet, wash my whole body. But Jesus says, you are already clean except for one of you. Because Jesus already knew that there was someone there who was going to betray him. That's what the Bible says. Now, we come to the NIV where it says the son of perdition. It means ruined, um, and it says the son of waste, uh, the, the, the son of the lost of man. And if we look at Genesis 3, chapter 15, and, and Jesus, uh, God is putting a curse upon the, the woman. He says the seed of the woman, or the seed of the promise, if we look at, uh, will be raised up against the seed of the flesh. So we hear, we see that, that, that the, the son of perdition is actually the seed of the flesh, whereas the believers in Christ are the son of the promises. If we, if we flick across quickly, and I hope you've got your Bibles or your, your electronic devices, whatever, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, it says there, let no one deceive you by any means. Paul's talking to the church of Thessalonica. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. We knew that as the apostasy. What does the falling away mean? It means doesn't mean the falling away from the faith. It just means falling away, standing aloof from the truth comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Oh, we got that, that word again. The son of perdition is revealed. How can the son of perdition be revealed? The son of perdition is revealed because it's a false gospel that's being revealed. Paul ta often talks about the false gospel. What is a false gospel? A true gospel, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, who was preaching the kingdom of God, was talking about grace. We hear the Apostle of Paul talking about grace. A false gospel is anything you have to do to enhance it. When Eve took the apple, she wanted to enhance the garden. Does God really, did God really say that, that you, you can't take? Well, hold on. Maybe God didn't really say. All we've got to do is listen to God's word and not go with a false gospel. When, when, when grace comes along, there's nothing you've got to add to it. You either are going to fall under the law or you're going to fall under grace. If you fall under grace, that means you are in Christ and Christ is in you and he died for you. Now, when, when we see that, that, that Jesus openly says, in the middle of this beautiful chapter, when he says that 
all the glory has come on to me, and Father, I'm going to glorify you, and the glory has come to me because they have glorified me, because they've honored me. And all of a sudden, he brings in this dark verse. I've, I've kept everyone except the son of perdition. So it, it makes you and I think, well, whoa, hold on a second. If he can be lost, then surely we can. But we look and, and we see John 10, verse 28. And it says there that none shall be lost. No one, the Bible says, no one shall be grasped out of my hand. We then, we look at Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. Paul says to the Roman church, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things yet to come. In other words, things that are present, nor things that are in the future to come nor the height, nor depth. He goes into great detail. Nor any other created thing. In other words, Satan shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Then you are mocked in heaven. That's what you are. Now, the son of perdition, let's have a look at that. What does that mean? Son of perdition was an idiom of that time. We have idioms today. We've got idioms where if I said, uh, Pete kicked the bucket. And it doesn't mean that Pete literally kicked the bucket. It means that Pete died. So we know what it means. So an idiom is like that. It, it gives you something, but it's got another meaning behind it. Son of perdition is an idiom. Because we've got other uh, 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 idioms as well. We've got the son of man. What does that mean? Is he the son of man? Yeah, well, we know that that men produce sons, okay. What about the son of David? Jesus was the son of David. But he wasn't the son of David. He was the son of Joseph. So what does that mean? The son of David is, is maybe it means he came with David's character, perhaps. Well, personally, between you and me, I hope he didn't come with David's character because David wasn't allowed to build a temple because there was blood in his hands. David was the one who slept with another man's wife. David was the one who had the other man's wife killed. So he didn't come with his character, but he came with the promise. He's the son of the promise. Isaac was the son of the promise. Remember when, when Sarah couldn't have a baby and, and Abraham came and God said, your wife's going to have a baby and, I, and, and Sarah laughed. That's why Isaac was called Isaac because Isaac or Isaac in Hebrew means laughter. Jacob was the son of promise. He was promised that he was going to have the promised land. David strong was the promise because he was pro the, the, the throne was promised that, that there would always be someone to reign on it. Always someone who would rule and reign and who would not be betray that promise. So what about Judas? Well, he was with the 12, wasn't he? So we, we think of him as being, we think of Judas as being maybe sneaky, uh, untrustworthy. Ooh, it, it, it was a, a strange thing you know, to think of Judas because we often think of him not, he's not mentioned in, in verse 12, but that's who everybody's thinking about. He was one of the 12, though. He had communion. with. He was one of the ones that Jesus washed his feet. And Jesus, in that chapter, said he knew he was going to be trying. Can you imagine washing someone's feet, but stooping down, who, knew, who you knew was going to betray you? He had communion with him. He gave him the bread. He gave him the wine. But you see, the thing with Judas was he wasn't born of the Spirit. Like Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.3, 3, he wasn't born of the Spirit. His purposes and his motives weren't Jesus' motives. His motive for the kingdom of God was for Jesus to rule with an iron fist, with a sword, and to kill the Romans. Jesus' kingdom was of a higher authority. It was a spiritual authority. Judas was zealous. He was zealous for the kingdom to be established his way. Just like Satan was. Satan wanted that kingdom. Satan wanted to have that pride. Satan wanted to have everything. He wanted to have everything. But in verse 13 and 14, Jesus says, wow, but now I come to you. Yeah. But the more I think about Judas, well, I'll talk to you now. 13, 14, but now I come to you 
And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy. So Jesus is now saying, hey, we hit, we hit a bump in the road, but I'm telling you that this is joy. I had to mention it, and the joy will be fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, Father, and your world has hated them because you're not of this world. They're not of this world. And I'm not of this world. They are sanctified. That means they're set apart because the word set them apart. Why? Because the word is truth. Now, let's just finish by thinking about Judas. Chapter 13, Jesus washes Judas' feet. Chapter 13, Jesus declares who's going to betray him. Chapter 13, he gives out the bread, he gives the wine. Chapter 13, Jesus says the one who dips the salt, the, the bread and the wine is the one who's going to betray me. They saw it. When Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, they all turned around. They all said, well, is it me? Is it me? I mean, you can think of, of Thomas, of James, of John. They're all there. Peter, is it me? I wonder if it's me. If Judas was such a sneaky, lurky character, wouldn't they all think, well, guess what? We think it's Judas. But he wasn't. He seemed to fit in. Even when he left, even when he dipped it in and he took it and, and he, he rushed out, they didn't say, oh, well, gee, it must be Judas. Why? Because Judas was trustworthy. He was in charge of the purse. Maybe Judas was going out to buy something. Maybe he had gone to purchase something for the Passover. Maybe he had gone to purchase something for the crucifixion. That's what they thought. Judas was a trustworthy guy. And you know what? We've got lots of people like that in the church but they're not born of the Spirit. We've got lots of people who will work and hard and they do things and they do all sorts of things for the church, but they're not born of the Spirit. They're doing it for the wrong reason. They're not called to the common purpose of Jesus. Jesus says you've got to be sanctified and set apart. Sanctified, sanctified, set apart, set apart for the Word. What, what does that mean? It means the Word of God is more important to you anything else, than anything you can accrue, than any money you can get, but any, whatever benefits or gifts that you think you're going to get come short. You've got to be set apart to spread the word of God. Bless you. When you, when you just think of when Judas committed suicide, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that he hung himself and his guts burst open. Wow, <laughs> sounds horrible. But I want to tell you, when his guts burst open, what would have been seen in those guts? You would have seen the bread and you would have seen the wine. What set him apart? The word of God. He wasn't going by the word of God. Let us remain faithful and true to God's word, not to anything else. Now next week, the prayer it includes you and I. So it's exciting. God bless for now, and I'll see you then.